Coming up on this week's show, we find out how K.A. Mitchell's childhood play dates led to her writing career. This is the Big Gay Fiction Podcast, the show for avid readers and passionate fans of gay romance fiction. Each week, we bring you exclusive author interviews, book recommendations, and explore the latest in gay pop culture. Welcome, everyone, to episode 170 of the Big Gay Fiction Podcast. I'm Will from WillKanaus.com, and with me, as always, is my co-host and husband, Mr. Jeff Adams. Hello. Now, we'll have more information on how you can help support this show uh, towards the end of this episode. We'll also have a sneak peek of what we have coming up next week. Until then, let's talk about what we've been doing for the last seven days. Uh, we've been sick, mm -hmm. uh, if you can't tell by how strange I sound. <laughs> Um, I sound underwater to my own ears, but that's just me. Um, so, yay! What a great way to start 2019. <laughs> right? I, hope, I hope you've all fared a little better than we have. Yeah. Also, uh, in the midst of all the sick this week, uh, I actually got a book up for pre-order. Uh, I put up a short novella called Head in the Game. Uh, Longtime podcast listeners may remember that this was the short story that I did for the 2017 charity anthology, Changing on the Fly, the second period. I'm now bringing this story out as a standalone, and uh, it'll be releasing on January 24th. I have picked this date deliberately uh, because it is the Thursday that leads into the NHL All-Star Weekend, and since this particular short story revolves around an NHL hockey player who's having a little slump with his game, and he actually returns to his hometown to get a little coaching from his high school coach and manages to maybe have a little bit of a distraction uh, with someone who he might be falling in love with. So you can check out Head in the Game up for pre-order at all of the usual outlets, and I will, of course, have a link in the show notes so that you can find that really easily. Now, last week, when we were sort of summing up and looking forward to the new year, uh, we forgot to talk about the podcast itself. <laughs> <laughs> Sort of yes and sort of no, because last week's, of course, last week's episode, at least on Monday when it came out, was still within 2018. And so I didn't have the full the full bank of data to look at. But 2018, thanks to all of you, our listeners, was the show's uh, best year yet. Uh, of course, in November, we rolled into year three of the podcast. Uh, we put out 50 and a half hours, roughly, of content in 2018. That includes the weekly episodes, uh, the bonus episodes we did for GRL, uh, bonus episodes that occasionally we fed in because we had interviews that ran really long. Uh, so that's that's pretty amazing. What it doesn't count is the 11 bonus episodes we did for Patreon. So that's roughly another uh, somewhere between six and probably nine hours of content, depending because those episodes go from 30 minutes to about 45 usually. So we made a lot of content last year, and you guys thankfully ate it all up uh, because we had 31% more downloads in 2018 than we did in 2017. Um, and especially strong last year was our fourth quarter, which of course runs October through the end of the year. Um, so many people came in, discovered our backlist episodes, started listening consistently week after week. And we saw our, our first week download numbers go up. Uh, it was really tremendous, so thank you all for coming and finding us and spreading the word, too, because if you, it's one thing if you just show up and start listening. It's another if you start telling everybody else that you're listening as well. So thank you for that, because that was really cool to see that in our third year, and I'm, I'm excited about what 2019 may bring for that. High school hockey player? Computer whiz? Covert agent? Theo Reese's life is split between being a normal teenager and a secret agent who goes by the code name Winger. After years of providing mission support from behind his keyboard, he's thrust into an unexpected world of adventure and danger. In Audio Assault, the third thrilling book in the code name Winger series by Jeff Adams, a family friend needs urgent help. Theo is off to New York City, where he uncovers an insidious plot. Popular song files have been modified to steal personal data and emit a tone that drives some listeners into a homicidal rage. Theo races against the clock to stop the music from causing worldwide chaos. Anna at Gay Book Reviews says, 
The twists the plot took were so unexpected and exciting that I just couldn't put it down. Get Audio Assault, an ebook or paperback, at Amazon and other online retailers. I want to give a big shout out and thanks to John Solo uh, for doing the new ads for Tracker Hacker, which you heard for the first time in last week's episode, and also for the Audio Assault spot. Uh, since he's the voice of the Codename Ringer books now, it's really awesome that he's doing the spots that run inside the podcast. So thank you, John. Now, the holidays may be over because, you know, it is January 7th as this podcast drops, but you've got one last Christmas moment to share with us. Yes, the holidays may be over, but I'm still a going. Um, <laughs> te- okay, technically, I do have a pet peeve about reading holiday books after the new year. Technically, I finished Summerfield's Angel on December 31st. So I'm okay. well within my <laughs> own guidelines for holiday cheer. Um, Summerfield's Angel by Kim Fielding is the last Christmas book I read for 2018. And this is part of the Christmas Angel multi-author series. Um, we talked about a few of those books uh, in a past episode. Uh, and this keeps the um, Christmas spirit alive. It is a historical book set in 1880. New York, roughly a hundred years after the first book in the series. And it is the story of Albie. He is a Nebraskan ranch hand who has made his way to New York City uh, in search of what might be left of his family. Um, When he was younger, he was like uh, sent away because his family was just too poor to keep him around. So uh, he spent a couple of years uh, out in Nebraska Uh, And now he's back, um, and he goes to uh, Five Corners, um, which is a notorious spot in lower Manhattan filled with, you know, crime and filth and all that wonderful stuff. Um, (laughs) The I'm trying, the Scorsese movie um, Gangs of New York takes place in Five Corners. Okay. Incidentally. Anyway, so uh, he, he heads down that way. Uh, And on his way, he uh, comes across a Smithfield's department store. Um, There's a Christmas window display, and he stops to admire it. And in the window, what do you know? It's the Christmas angel. Uh, (laughs) She's sitting atop the tree uh, in Smithfield's window. Uh, And it is there that Albie runs into an adorable guy named Zeno. His full name is Xenocrates, but everyone calls him Zeno. Uh, (laughs) Uh, and um, he suggests Albie maybe try uh, getting a room at the YMCA. He'll probably have, you know, better, safer luck than trying to uh, find a, a spot to bed down for the night in Five Corners. So that's what Albie does. Uh, he gets himself set up at the YMCA while he tries to find what's left of his family, uh, which isn't very much. The, the small like tenement building where he grew up is no longer there. So he sort of hit a dead end where that's concerned. But uh, as luck would have it, he keeps running into Zeno and they get to know one another. And uh, eventually, of course, uh, because this is a romance novel, uh, (laughs) they they, uh, end up falling in love. Uh, Meanwhile, Albie has decided to try to make a go of it in New York City. And he becomes a West Side Cowboy. What is that, you might ask? I might, Uh, yes. (laughs) Because I had no idea what a West Side Cowboy was. Um, As it turns out, uh, on the west side of Manhattan uh, is what we currently know as uh, Hudson Yards. Mm -hmm. Uh, And during this period of time in New York City, uh, a lot of pedestrians would um, try and make it across the train tracks. And a lot of them, uh, as it so turns out, were getting run over on a regular basis. Hmm. So... (laughs) Um, the transport authority um, employed cowboys, essentially, to ride in front of the trains, either waving a flag or a red lantern, to make sure no one runs out in front of a train. So that's what Albie does. He gets himself a job being one of the West Side Cowboys. And um, <clears throat> one day while he's at work, he um, sees a vision of the Christmas angel. 
and the angel is uh, warning him and telling him that Zeno needs his help. So he r- rides off on his pony um, <laughs> to Five Corners, where he discovers uh, Zeno getting beat up by some street toughs. Uh oh! And he comes in and uh, saves the day. Uh, when he wakes up, he's in the uh, Smithfield Mansion, um, and everyone is incredibly appreciative of uh, what Albie has done, uh, saving their beloved Zeno. And he ends up um, spending Christmas Day with the Smithfield family. Um, and it becomes readily apparent that uh, the, the family knows and understands and accepts Albie's uh, proclivities. And it's uh, incredibly obvious that uh, Albie and Zeno have uh, very strong feelings for one another. So um, <laughs> Zeno's father suggests maybe that they make a life for themselves uh, on the West Coast, uh, specifically in Oregon, where um, the Smithfield department store uh, gets a lot of their like uh, European and Asian like uh, tchotchkes, mm. um, like you know fine china stuff like that. Yeah. For the department store comes in through the West Coast, so he gets them set up there. Incidentally, because Alby. Um, un, un, I mean, I'm sorry, Zeno, unbeknownst to Albi, was actually doing research on where Albi's family might be. And he discovers, oh. that's why he was in Five Corners, by the way, and getting beat up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so uh, what's left, um, Albi's youngest brother has made his way to uh, the Oregon coast. Uh, so that's where they end up going and living happily ever after. Um, I really, really, really enjoyed this story an awful lot. It's um, just full of a lot of wonderful Christmas spirit. Uh, I, I adore the two main characters. And what was really, really nice about this, the author, Kim Fielding, managed to really give you a sense of place and what New York was like in that specific time period. Um, it's full of a lot of really rich period detail without like being like bogged down with like, you know, Wikipedia research. There's there. Yeah, there's no info dumping going on here. It's all like natural and through the character's own point of view. Um, so I highly recommend checking out Smithfield's Angel, um, even though uh, we are in the new year. Um, maybe put that on your Christmas reading list for next year. Um, a quick note. Um, Kim Fielding did a series of blog posts on her website about some of the research she did uh, to bring this story to life. Uh, She talks about uh, certain historical aspects of New York, um, you know, certain locations and um, things about the West Side Cowboys and Five Corners and all that sort of stuff. Uh, Stuff that I found personally really, really interesting. So if you've read Smithfield's Angel and would like to know a little bit more, all you have to do is go to Kim Fielding's website. That's kfieldingwrites.com. And if you check out her blog right now, those posts should be in the first page or two. If you're listening to this podcast in the far-flung future, (laughs) um, all you have to do is do a search on her website for Smithfield's Angel, and you'll get the notes for this story. Cool. And of course, we'll put her website into the show notes as well. And if I find a way I can lock onto those blog posts, I will put that in yeah. as well. So I kicked off my new year with a book that I've been highly anticipating, a young adult title called Lock and West by Alexander C. Eberhardt. Um, now, back in episode 130, I reviewed Adam Silvera's History is All You Left Me. And with that review, at the end of it, you were like, why did you even read that book? That sounds like so so much angst and heartache and everything. Okay, folks, this is another one of those books. Uh, but it's like that one. It's so worth the ride. Now, this is Alexander's second book uh, after There Goes Sunday School, which I reviewed back in 148 and completely adored. Uh, Locke and West is the story of Lachlan, who goes by Locke for short. Uh, he's recently moved to Atlanta after his father passed away. And his mother moved the family down there to be near her sister, um, Aunt Jill, um, who's also recently been in an accident and is actually now in a wheelchair um, as part of her recovery. Um, Locke also has a younger brother named Jack, uh, who he mostly is now taking care of because mom's working a lot of hours 
to help make ends meet for the family uh, now that their father is gone. Um, Jack is certainly an introvert. Uh, he's a writer, a uh, very creative type. Um, there's something there that he may have some, it's OCD or he might be a little bit on the autism spectrum. Uh, it's never fully discussed, which is actually something I like about this book, that not every single thing that's in it necessarily has to get a label slapped on it. Uh, you just realize through his mannerisms and through his internal dialogue that, you know, sometimes he, he may need to count something to have to calm himself down um, and things like that. Uh, West is short for Wesley. Uh, he's a privileged kid. He knows he's privileged. He's got rich parents who, who tend to ignore him quite a lot. Uh, he's very extroverted and tends to really overcompensate um, for what he feels are his shortcomings. Um, and he also has a lot of issues with his uh, older sister right now. Um, he can't stand uh, her fiancé for reasons that we find out much later in the book. Um, and his sister also revealed an eating disorder that he has uh, to his parents, which sent him to therapy, and he actually resents his sister for that. Um, the thing that I love about this book so much, A, the characters of Locke and West are so wonderfully drawn and rich and Alexander stays away from the info dump that you actually mentioned in your book. Mm -hmm. We find out about these characters piece by piece, uh, really, really like peeling back, you know, very cliche, peeling back the layers of the onion mm -hmm. to see what makes these characters such a mess. And often broken. There are trigger warnings that, you know, go with this book around eating disorders and sexual abuse and PTSD uh, that are there for a, for a reason. And if you're triggered by those, you, you know, navigate this book carefully because Alexander doesn't pull any punches around these topics either. Uh, because it's certainly something that young people in this day and age uh, deal with a lot. Um, while these characters are messy, um, and it's not just Locke and West, their parents are messed up on both sides, um, I kept being really surprised how Alex kept opening up these new areas uh, for these young men and their, and their families, and seeing how it kind of plugged into everything and how the, the boys would deal with it. And what's so nice is that these two gravitate towards each other and and really f start to find home with each other and, and a certain peace with each other, even while they think some of what's happening to the other person is actually their fault. Like, these things happen to Locke, and West is convinced that he actually caused certain chain of events because he you know, doesn't believe in himself enough to think that he was actually helping instead of, instead of in his mind, hurting. Um, as all of this happens, Alexander manages to tie a lot of this stuff up towards the end to where you at least have a sense that people are okay. I mean, obviously, every the, the things that I mentioned here around sexual abuse and PTSD aren't things that just, you can't magically just put those away in a lot of cases, but you see how people are getting the help and the support and corners have been turned to start to let these people find happiness. And especially for Locke and West, the thing that threw me with There Goes Sunday School a little bit, if you remember that in that review, was that you didn't get the two boys together at the end. They ended as friends, but they ended up separated because somebody moved. Here you see Locke and West actually you know, starting to form what one hopes is a long-term uh, relationship, or at least perhaps as long-term as like a high school relationship might last. Uh, but it ends in a really good spot. And it was, it's such a tremendous read how he, I can't emphasize enough how awesome it was, how he kept feeding in bits of information and how things unfolded in a way that you really just had to keep turning the pages because it was so good to see where it turned out. So I'm really tremendously pleased with this first book that I came into 2019 with. Uh, Lock and West uh, releases on Tuesday, January 8th. Uh, if you want to hear from Alexander, you can go back to the interview I had with him in episode 152. 
And uh, yeah, if you want to take a chance on some really powerful YA, I suggest Lock and West by Alexander C. Everhart. Mm-hmm. Real quickly, I want to sum up uh, one other book that I finished reading this past week. It's called BFF by K.C. Wells. And this isn't really a gay romance in the traditional sense. It's the story of David and Matt. And David is our first person narrator. And the book is sort of a biographical it's entirely fictional, but it's sort of a biographical memoir-ish look at their uh, friendship uh, over many, many years. Um, we meet David and Matt uh, first as kids, uh, doing like thing, you know, normal kid stuff, like trying to catch turtles at the pond, that kind of thing. And we follow them uh, as they grow up over the years, like going to high school and college, and eventually the two of them living together as like twenty. 20-somethings trying to like make it work out in the big bad world and it's at this point that a rather serious health scare really forces them to examine what their true feelings for one another are. Um, This book is loosely based on a true story although Matt and David are entirely fictional. I really like this story. It's a little unconventional and it kind of veers away from what I normally read, but I really, really enjoyed it. It's very uplifting, uh, a a wonderful feel-good way to start 2019. And uh, I highly recommend also checking out the audiobook. It's read by a guy named Michael Mula, who I've never heard before. Uh, I thought he did a wonderful job of um, capturing, uh, since this was a first-person narrative, um, I think he did a really interesting uh, and well-done uh, way of, of like capturing David's voice as um, he grows up. Uh, and the relationship between the two main characters evolves over the year. So I recommend checking out BFF by K.C. Wells. Want to hang out with us between shows? Check us out on Facebook. You never know what we might post. News about book sales, bonus video content, and maybe even a live broadcast or two. Like us today at facebook.com slash biggayfictionpodcast and see what we get up to next. And just a reminder, since we're talking about Facebook, uh, you can join us live on Sunday mornings to watch us record the podcast. We usually start between 7.30 and 8 a.m. Pacific time. So if you're interested in seeing what goes on a little bit behind the scenes of the recording of the show, do join us on Facebook on Sunday mornings. This past week, I had the opportunity to talk to K.A. Mitchell, uh, which I adored. I don't know, as I say in the interview, I don't know why we haven't had her on the show sooner than this. Uh, We talk about her origins, which include a delightful story about Ken and G.I. Joe, um, as well as her Bad in Baltimore series. So let's get to that. K.A. Mitchell, welcome to the podcast. Hi, thank you for having me. I'm extremely excited to be here. Yeah, we're thrilled to have you. and Honestly, can't believe we've we've not had you on already. (laughs) I just, a lot of people have said to me, oh, I didn't think you went out in public and did public things. I'm like, I must come across as a little bit of a recluse. But I love talking to readers and and bloggers and other authors. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, and that's, of course, one of the reasons we like having the show is it gives us reason to to talk to folks outside of, like, GRL or something. Yes, yes. And I and I like going to GRL anytime I can afford it. I think maybe that's what it is. I just can't afford to go out in public. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sometimes I, the budget can like force you into reclusive, reclusiveness. Yes, yes. Or they can dress her up, but they can't take her out. <laughs> Let's dive into some of your origin story. Uh, you've okay. been you've been writing an MM romance for a while now, and I love what you've got in your bio. That says, you know, as a as a child, you were much more into Ken and GI Joe as a couple than Ken and Barbie. Absolutely. Uh, so, where did all this start for you to tell these kinds of stories? It's it is it is pretty funny, and and I I was reading the uh, hockey player's heart, and I saw that mention of the dolls, and I thought that was so funny. I was I was thinking about that when I saw that in your book about. Uh, the hockey players. Um, yeah, he's his he's, model. He's got his do- action and the, figure. And Aaron's calling it a doll, and Caleb's like, "No, it's a replica." Yeah. One six. 
<laughs> exactly. But um, I'm. It's so funny because I can remember distinctly being in Mrs. DeBerry's art class, and we were all working at this one long table, and I think I was in second or third grade, and one of the boys across the table from me asked me if I had heard of um, two men getting married because there was a court case going on in Minnesota, apparently. I don't, I looked it up as an adult and these two men were trying to marry and they were married, they were suing for uh, sexual equality because why couldn't he be allowed to marry a man? And you know, and this boy was like, this was, he was just bursting with this news. And all I could think of was, well, which one wears the dress? Because to me, the only reason you would get married is because you could get dressed up in fluffy, frilly clothes. I'm like, why would anybody else get married? And he's like, no, <laughs> no, they wear suits. Because I, I, having looked at the media, you could see pictures of them. And he's like, no, they wear suits. And I said, Okay. And he said, but they kiss. And I just, I can just remember, I remember that moment and go, I like that. That sounds right. That's, that's right to me. And I, you know, I probably should have known that I was gay back then, but I didn't because I went through the whole, but I'm a cheerleader thing, even though I was never a cheerleader because I had the long hair and I liked fluffy, frilly skirts and that kind of a thing. And I just didn't occur to me because the only people I knew who were gay were, or women who were gay were not feminine at all. So I thought that's how it rolled. It was, you know, it was 1970s. I'm very old. Um <laughs> But when I was, I was, and I also distinctly remember playing Barbies at Peggy's house. And I was like, well, I think these two should be in the bed together. That's how they should, that's how it should work. And I just know that I was never, ever invited back to Peggy's house to play Barbie. <laughs> and it was so sad because she had her mom for an after school snack served graham crackers with chocolate frosting on them. And I was forever denied that for my love of Ken and G.I. Joe in the Barbie house together. <laughs> it's interesting because as you as, as, as I read this thing about you and the G.I. Joe, because remembering back to the G.I. Joe that I had, I had, it was in the era that G.I. Joe was pretty rugged and had the beard, mm -hmm. a very, very brillo -y kind of beard on, on the mm -hmm. action figure. And I'm thinking, and I was thinking of that juxtaposed against, you know, very clean cut Ken. And it's like, yes. yeah, I can see that. <laughs> yes. I, I thought they made a good pair. And I, you know, Ken and I don't know, was there, was it Chip? I think it was Chip was the, was the other male for the not as not for the girls who were not Barbie was he Chip or Skip or something like that? But I always thought that boys should be with boys and girls should be with girls. And it just made sense that way. I, I couldn't see why other people couldn't see it like that. And quite the I, progressive conversation to have in third grade, too. Yes. I remember getting into an argument with my grandmother and I was in my early, like, I think I was about 12 when Anita Bryant was doing her, her thing. And she was talking about homosexuals teaching. And I just couldn't. I just could never see what was wrong with it. It just didn't make any, for people to be offended by it didn't make any sense to me. I mean, I, and I, I mean, yes, I, I feel like I grew up in a fairly liberal household and my, um, but it's not like I wasn't exposed to sexism or racism or eventually homophobia, including my own internalized, but it's just two boys, two girls. That's how it should work. Mm -hmm. And here we are all these years about. later and it, it, it's, it's come to pass that we could all get married and stuff. Yes, it is. It's very exciting. And, uh, and even after that, I always, I found myself drawn to anything where there was a hint, especially that um, two male characters might kiss. I was, you know, even very, very young, I was always looking for that in a story or wanting that to happen or, 
slashing characters in my head even before I knew what slashing was. And it's, you know, it's funny to me that I didn't realize that this was where my voice would be happiest until now. I read there was a science fiction series. I meant to look it up. Um, the author's name was Mel. I, this is why I would be terrible on Jeopardy. I can never remember anyone's last name. Um, but the author's name was Mel, and he or she wrote these two or three novels about these guys who ended up bonded through an empath bond, and they became this really great team of interstellar gang and drug ring busters and it was it was a great series i loved it and was one of the first things i found that was had enough romance in it for me because i would always go over to the um when i even after i came out i would go into gay bookstores and i'm like yeah there's the lesbian coming out stories one more coming out story i'm like can i just read about people who are already out and i would go over to the to the men's side and but they were all mysteries or science fiction and I had to take the mystery or science fiction to get my romance fix. Mm -hmm. And it's, and then when I was, I was, I wrote one, I wrote a story that I'd always wanted to write uh, Regency romance and I sent it away for a, I think, I can't remember. I think it was Cleus press was doing a, best gay erotica or something like that. And I sent it away for that. And in the meantime, I joined RWA and I was trying to get heterosexual romance published. And my critique, one of my critique partners said, you know, they're buying gay male romance now. I'm like, they are, I could totally do that. And next thing I knew I had a story submission into Sam Hain and they bought it. So. Which book was, was that? Um, that was custom ride. It was a short story, and I wrote it in two weeks. What got you into writing in general? Oh, when I found out, I remember when I this see, I like I, I if you could just go back and record all of these bizarre epiphanies I had when I was in single digits, it would I I wish I'd known everything that I was going to do at the age of six though. I found out that what an author did was make books and I always loved to read. So I thought making books was about the best job ever, especially even as I got a little bit older and I thought, Oh, I'll be in a cabin out in the woods typing away, not having to deal with people. <laughs> I like this job. So, but my parents being very practical individuals, whenever I would announce my career intention as authoress because I was very into uh, gendered suffixes, um, my parents would say to me, and what else, dear? And what else, dear? Because they knew it was not a good way to make a living. So um, they made sure that I had uh, my certification as a teacher. And I did that for a very long time as my main source of income while trying to finish books and then trying to sell them. But I never, I mean, I wanted to do this from forever. And the fact that I get to do it and that there are books out there and complete strangers read them and then say something to me about them is just the most amazing thing ever. It really is the best, the best thing, or at least one of the best things to get to do for sure. Yes. It really is. I get to play with my imaginary friends. It's, that's what my job is. I love it. When you were doing Custom Ride and, and mm -hmm. kind of preparing to shift into this genre, were you reading anything in the genre yet? Or I was reading fan fiction. Mm -hmm. And um, I like I said, I, I remember that series. I read... Uh, a few gay mysteries. Um, after I sold Custom Ride, I went out and got recommendations. I read Allie Blue and I read Josh Lanyon and I read. Um, uh, I also really liked Kara Andrews way, way back. I mean, I still like her work, but um, I remember she was one of the first people I read 
but and now I read mostly when I read gay romance, I read mostly historical or paranormal because I find it does less to interfere with my story brain to stay out of contemporary. Mm-hmm. So only when I'm like taking a bigger break, like a couple of weeks, do I read a lot of of gay con- romance contemporary. That makes sense because yeah, you gotta keep your your writing brain and in, in going down the right path and not getting too influenced. Right. I don't want to suddenly be halfway through a book and go, "Oh, that was a much better idea. I need to do it like that." <laughs> What would you say are the trademark elements of your books? I like what I want readers to to get is I want readers to have people who feel real to them. I want um, them to imagine that they could actually talk to these people if they found them, that they would either want to punch them or or want to hug them. I like that. I would like readers to take away usually a laugh or two from the stories. I want readers to remember the characters more than the story. I just want them to take away a feeling for the, who the people are. And definitely I would like readers to find them hot. Mm-hmm. So I would say hot and good characterization. It's hard to That's go wrong I with hot and good characterization combined together. Yes. Hot, good characterization. And of course, K.A. always does a happy ending. No, no angsty cliffhanger for me. Do you look for similar in in the romances that you read to stay away from the angsty cliffhanger or? Oh, definitely. I'm I I need to know if I'm getting into something that's going to be a series. I, I like to know that ahead of time. And. You know, I can wait through several books as long as I know that everybody's not going to die at the end Um, because that would really make me unhappy. But I definitely I I, and we all find authors who we know are going to deliver the kind of story we want to read. I love an author who can make me really doubt that he or she is going to be able to pull the romance back together that there's just no way this just become too messed up and there's no way to fix this. And then I'm always amazed when the author makes it work and makes me believe in it. And those are people who I trust and I will just run out and give them my money. I don't even have to read the blurb. <laughs> Do you want to give us an idea on who some of your one clicks like that are? Um, I, my one click right now who I'm I just always buy is KJ Charles. I'm just in awe of her work. Absolutely in awe. I I can't <laughs> I read it. I'm just like, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to write anything today because it'll never measure up to that. Thank goodness she writes historical or I'd really be suffering. Um I like uh I like Jordan Castile Price. I like uh Jordan Hawk. I was I loved reading LB Gregg, but I don't think she's written anything in a while because she just made me laugh so hard. I like Heidi Cullinan's work. I'm looking forward to her new series. She's one of the contemporary authors that I do read, but I definitely have to take a break before I read them mm-hmm. from my own stuff. Let's talk about your big series, Bad in Baltimore. The six book series currently, as we record this, mm-hmm. for those who aren't familiar with it, uh, what's it all about? Well, it like most of most of the time when I write a series, it wasn't supposed to be a series. I had this idea for this very tropey story. I had the idea of um, the kind of classic uh, category romance of a kind of a marriage of convenience and bad blood between the families and a father who is kind of forcing his son into this arranged marriage situation. And I wanted to set it and I knew I was going to use a background of a, of a soda company. And I wanted a East coast city because that's where I'm from. And I feel like I can write, the East Coast better. I wanted a city on the East Coast large enough 
to have a good sized gay community and a that could support a bottling industry. And one of my readers said, how about Baltimore? And I said, I like Baltimore. I could do Baltimore. And so and I'm, now I love it because I get to go down there and wander around and do research and write it off. But so I set the book in Baltimore. And when Eli bounced in as, as Nate's ex-boyfriend and friend, I knew he was going to have to have his own book. And then Quinn needed someone to talk to. And then there was Jamie and he was going to need his own. It's so it's, that's, that's how that whole series has been. And the last story bad habit was because I couldn't let go of beach and tie the characters in bad behavior. I needed to see them a little bit farther. And I was walking around at a car show and imagining my imaginary friends there with me. And then the opening scene in, in Bad Habit just popped into my head and then there were more Baltimore characters. And while I was working on that, one of the characters from Bad Attitude came and started talking to me. I'm like, I don't know. I don't know if you can have a happy ending. You're kind of a jerk. So um, we'll have to see. But I did a lot of research for that. It's one of... It, it's going to be tricky. So usually I don't plan much, but this one I'm planning a bit more because I need to figure out, I need to figure out if I can make him redeemable. And it's not Peter. I've been telling some readers have been asking me, you're not going to redeem Peter, which is uh, Quinn's ex-boyfriend. And I said, no, Peter is irredeemable. He's horrible. He's a cheater and a liar. And, he is a very bad person. So no, <laughs> it's not Peter. Given that you, you hadn't perceived it as a series. Do you just go from book to book and see if the next one clicks into place after that? Or do you see an end somewhere in sight or can you just keep populating Baltimore conceivably, you know, for eternity? I could. I I do see that. I also would really like to write a, and I have it started, I want to write um, at least kind of like a look into the future for the first three couples mm. with the other couples playing uh, background. But it gets a little tricky when you bring in all of the couples and there are 10 people at the table and the two main characters who you're writing then don't know the 10 friends so it can be a little tricky and I always want to make them accessible for the reader I don't want the reader to feel that they need a list of characters at the front of the book so that they don't get confused like I don't know if you ever read any of those fantasies where they had the whole long list of characters yeah like here's the entire family tree for everything yes, yes. <laughs> I don't want I don't want readers to have to do that much work. That's my job to make it feel like they've known these people. It's not their job to keep track of of things. So um, sometimes some of the characters have to be left out of a scene because there's it's just getting big. Right. But I, I like coming back to visit them and I hope that readers enjoy seeing their old friends. That's what it feels like when I get to hang out with them again is like going to see people you haven't seen in a while hanging out but Jiro exactly it's like that one big reunion mm -hmm. how many more books do you see currently in Baltimore well I definitely have the next one I don't know I I have another character whose story I would like to write if I could figure out who I need to know a little bit more. I have a meet cute in mind for him, but I don't know much about the other hero. So he would have to talk to me a little bit. And a lot of people have asked me um, about a character named Marco, but he's really, really young. He's not at all ready for an HEA or even an HFN. He just, he basically spends a lot of time opining that he needs his cherry popped. So um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what's going to, I might, I might write him a short story where he at least gets that much accomplished. But um, I, those, I know I definitely want to try 
um, the character that I've been planning on. And then I'd like to do um, Nick, who appeared in Bad Behavior as uh, Ty's mentor. So, and then I don't know, but I always have more stories. I have, I have a, there's always, I'm sure you know, the plot bunnies, they just, reproduce and reproduce and I put them all in a folder and if I can't not think about them I'll write them a scene and see where that's going to go but then if you start selling things on proposal things are due and yeah those deadlines can certainly wreak havoc with where your plot buddies want to go <laughs> yes because they they and I when I teach writing and I'm um, my one of my workshops is on writer's block. And one of the things I talk about is the mistress and wife syndrome, because the book you're writing is like your wife and you love it and you love her and you want to spend time with her, but there's that shiny new piece out there. And, but the thing is, if you marry your mistress, she's just going to be another wife. So, um, <laughs> you got to stay with, you got to love the one you're with before you go moving on to new greener territories. <laughs> But, yeah, those plot bunnies, they just, oh, look at that. That's so shiny out there. Yeah, it right. wouldn't be hard like the book I'm writing now. You mentioned that the Baltimore series, you, you were looking at, like, category romances mm -hmm. for these stories. What is it about category? Because category is such a a special thing in, it, in its way because of kind of the the formula and the very tropiness of it all. What attracts you to that kind of story to tell? I really like, um, I don't feel like the other ones were as, as trope inspired as Bad Company was, but um, I love, when I think about a story, one of the things I, I think about is what's the glue that's going to keep, because if they meet and they decide that they can't, have this relationship what's going to keep them from just going you know what i'm not going to and and wandering off to a big city like baltimore or even moving to another part of the country to get away from the guy you can't get out of your head so those tropes act like the glue to stick them together and i i love how they can do that and i love trying to deliver the familiar but in a way that is new for the characters, is new for the reader and new for this telling of it. Um, I, I've written a lot of books of that are second chance stories or in the case of Bad Habit, even a third chance. But I always feel like it's it's different. So even if you write the same trope, opposites attract, second chance romance, if you're writing secret marriage or secret babies, you can write the same theme, but as long as you tell it in a fresh way with fresh characters, it's always going to be different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's so there's infinite combinations mm -hmm. for the tropes. But I like the I like that I'm like oh when I'm reading I love a story where I'm like oh this is how it's going to go I see because I'm familiar with the trope and I read a lot of romances and then the author uses it and kind of pulls the rug out from under me I'm like oh that was clever so I I hope that sometimes when I'm I'm playing with a trope it it's at least fresh for them when they're when they're reading it um I'll I'll whisper because no one will hear me because I'm on a podcast. I'll whisper and say that I'm playing with Amnesia for the seventh book in the Baltimore series. And I'm really excited about that because I love Amnesia stories. Okay, now you've mentioned Amnesia and you said you've you've written a lot of second chances. Mm -hmm. What what are some of your other very favorite tropes, either to write or to read? I love the whole um, cut off from like, you know, snowed in stuck in an elevator i love reading things like that i love an opposites attract i love road trip stories i've always wanted to to write something with some kind of a chase in it uh some kind of a, a road trip running off kind of a thing um i love stories that redeem 
what seems like a, an alpha hole, as they call them in Romance Landia, I I will I will pick those up. I love a taboo, a guardian ward kind of a a relationship. Um, that's like crack. I can't not read the blurb on one of those. Is there a trope? I always feel like I'm like I should be saying more to the question. I'm sorry. That was probably <laughs> edit that one out. <laughs> Is there a trope out there that you that you really want to take on as a writer that you haven't yet for some reason? Definitely the amnesia. I've I've always wanted that, and I I know what I like the new spin I want to put on that. Um, I really want to write a time travel book, and I just can never come up with a a story a world building that makes it work to me there has to be a reason for the t time traveling and anytime i come up with like a a paranormal or extra world idea it just feels so derivative to me whereas <laughs> telling you know second chance romance stories for the 800th time doesn't feel derivative at all and i don't know why that is but if it feels like i'm copying someone else's ideas I lose interest in it, one, because it feels bad, and two, because I've already read that story, mm -hmm. which is why I can't plan my stories out too far, because if I know how everything's going to work out, I can't write it, because I already read it, and I'm writing it because I want to read it. That's an interesting take on, on why you would pants more than you plot. I have a... I have this, I've had system now where I look at like, turning points and what often happens is the, what I think is going to be the black moment, what I think is going to be, oh my goodness, this is going to be such a big, important scene. That usually turns out to be only the halfway point instead of closer to the end. It's, it's funny, and I find that is true in some of the authors that I read. I'm like, oh, this is the problem that she's not going to be able to solve. And then I get there, and and it's wrapped up in the first third of the book. And, and I'm very intrigued about how it's going to work from here on in. So um, I, like, I like knowing a couple of big scenes. And then just when I start a scene, I need to know what – the emotion is behind it always like what are the feelings going in and I can't write out of order because of, of the emotion it's I, I mean I can throw down some ideas but I have to know and that's why people always I don't know how people can do insert sex scene here because if I could just insert sex scene here then it it doesn't belong in my story because they have to be different people mm -hmm. at the end of every scene than they were going into it and I have – I know people can just pull out scenes at random and, and write them and then make the story work, but that's not me. And, I mean, I'm sure they write – you know, I've read some of them in their beautiful books, but I have to know how they've changed based on the love scene or the argument or the reveal or having breakfast together or talking to their best friend. I have to know – where their feelings are at the end of the scene so that I can keep stomping on them until they give in to me. <laughs> what is your weak point? Let me push on that. Stomp, stomp, stomp. <laughs> oh, you shouldn't have told me. What's the rest of your process kind of look like as you're, as you're going? Are you, are you a daily writer or do you keep word counts or anything like I that? I feel like, that's when I do my best is when I'm a daily writer. Um, when I get to where I can almost see the end or where I get to when I feel like I'm about, I have about 10% left, it's the only thing I can think about. And it tends to come out in a big stream, um, usually because I'm desperate because I'm way past a deadline and <laughs> I really have to get it done. That does help. Um I I have a critique group that I love and we usually meet monthly. We can meet more if people need it because 
all of us are published and um, one, well, I, it's half my income. And for the other woman, she just recently retired. So it's all of her income. And so we're all very pro, not prolific, but we, we write as fast as we can. And I like to, I like to talk to, to other people who I sometimes exchange uh, pages with. They're very helpful, especially if they can give me feedback right, right there and say, yes, this is the right direction or no, I don't believe in this for this character. Um, but I definitely think that I'm better when I write every day because I'm able to stay more true to who the character was and it doesn't feel like I don't worry so much that I'm like, did I completely change personalities halfway through this book because I haven't worked on it in six months because mm, mm-hmm. I had to get something else done. So I'm, I'm very linear in that way. And I do like to, to have a word count. I'm very excited about writing a noveler because they just added this goals feature and you get little coach words down at the bottom where they're like, oh, good, go you, you wrote how many words? And when you hit your goal, it's it's very exciting. And I, I need validation. <laughs> <laughs> it's lonely. It's good to have validation. It's, you know, just me and my imaginary friends. And sometimes we wonder if we're actually doing this right. So you've hinted around a little bit at uh, that there's a new Baltimore book kind of in the offing. Mm-hmm. Uh, what are what all are you planning to get out to to the readers in 2019? In 2019, it would be nice if I could get that Baltimore book out. I would also like to send something to Karina. I have just the most vague impression of something. With actually, that's just a list of tropes at the moment. I don't even have a character to to beat over the head with them. So I have no idea. And then I have, um, I always, I mean, I have, I have so many things I want to write. Um, so I don't know what, what 2019 will hold. I do know that someone, and I can't really talk about it because it's my other pen name, um, but that's going to definitely have another book out. And hopefully my mom's not listening to the podcast. <laughs> She's not allowed to know about that pen name. Uh-oh. Yep. Well, don't tell mom I mean, you're on. Readers can know about the readers can know about Sim Forrester, but we aren't going to tell my mom about this podcast so that she doesn't know about Sim Forrester. Sim Forrester does not guarantee a happy ending, but they're eventually they'll get one. That's, That's okay. why she not, not everybody that. unfortunately can have a happy forever after. Well, they they get their happy ever after. They just it's just a lot more sex before they get it, and they're. When I write romance, I when they meet each other, that's it. They're not going to look at anybody else with any serious intent. So I, you know, and that's not the way it goes in my erotica. So it's definitely much more of a sexual journey, the Sin books. So the third book in her series will definitely be out soon. I'm almost done with it. That's very cool, having the alternate yeah, pen name. Yeah, like I said, it's not a secret. I don't mind. I just created two pen names so that readers would get the KA experience they expect without having to worry about it if it was a different – it's just a different flavor. It's like Diet Coke and Diet Cherry Coke. Yeah, yeah. It, it sets the right expectations. Yes. Now, you, we, we talked ever so briefly earlier on that you also teach writing. Yes, and, I love to, I yeah. love to do workshops on writing. I have one on on love scenes that I do that I I love sharing because I I feel like it's the thing that people use to put romance down to you know it's just about sex or because or and to me it's like if you were gonna write a a book about you you wouldn't say to a, a thriller author let's just skip all that stuff where where we're finding out who the bad guy is and just you know i just want to look at something else people don't treat other genre fiction the same way they treat romance and and i like to 
reinforce how important love scenes are. And they don't have to be sex scenes, but they do have to be intimate emotionally. And sometimes that comes through them physically, but they, they have to be aware of each other in an intimate way. And I like teaching that one. And I like teaching, I also, um, I make use a lot of Enneagrams as starting points for my characters. And I have a workshop on that. What is an Enneagram for those who may not know? An Enneagram is, um, I think of it in terms of like, it's about as reliable a personality predictor as an astrology, but, um, people have, they put people into nine different categories of behavior and then you're affected by your wings, which are the personalities on either side of you. And then you connect across the circle of nine with what they call stress and security points. So it's, it's a really good blueprint. I don't write to it like where, Oh, I can't give him that because he's a this, but, um, I like I like having that as a framework to build my character on. How did you get into the the teaching of writing? You mentioned you know you you had your teaching certificate and taught for quite a while. Was it just a natural progression? Yes, I I love teaching. I um one of the first stories that I fell in love with was Jonathan Livingston Seagull, which I read when I was eleven or twelve, and one of the things that this book is about is about loving people through teaching and sharing um, what you love with other people and how powerful that is. And I, I really enjoyed teaching when I could connect with my students and have them fall in love with literature, have them fall in love with story and learn to understand that books aren't these dusty things that you get you have to do a book report on but that there are stories out there that that will speak to you we just have to find what they are and i i actually missed that when i quit to write full time during the heyday of everybody was getting a kindle and my january sales were always like woo i love it mm -hmm. um but now and now I still love it. I'm teaching, I'm tutoring, and it's basically like teaching without lesson plans or correcting or having to fill out, usually have to fill out paperwork. So I was teaching at a school that got a little violent, so I had to leave that. And now the students have to pay to come to school, so most of the time they're not violent. I would hope not. You don't want to... <laughs> But I do, I do love the activity of teaching. I love, I love sharing. And as you and I were saying, I, we could talk fiction and genre and books forever. And it's just fun to, to talk to other writers. And I always learn something when I do a workshop because other people have different ways of looking at things. And I'm like, oh. Do you find that that keeps you constantly updating kind of what you're teaching because you keep picking up things along the way? Absolutely. I every time I I do a presentation on writing, I I add and I change. And you know, when I first started doing it, I would you know I had handouts and I would talk. And now I use powerpoints. And um, it's I've incorporated things that I keep learning because I keep learning from other other writers. Anytime I go to a workshop at a writing conference, I always pick up something that is going to make my work better. And I hope I use it, but I love learning about different ways to think about. It's always the same story because it's all about, you know, the character and the character's arc and the romantic arc. But some people just have a way of saying it that it clicks in your head and you're like, oh, I get it now. <laughs> some people just have a way of putting it. It doesn't necessarily mean that other people weren't great teachers. They just, this person just said it in a way that connects in your head. Yeah, exactly. Well, K.A., it has been awesome talking with you. And as we wrap up, tell everybody the best ways that they can keep up with you online to, to keep up with what you're uh, getting ready to release over the course of the year. Uh, my newsletter is the best way because when I 
anytime I have something come out, I put it in my newsletter. They get to they newsletter subscribers tend to get things first as far as an excerpt. I always try and give them something exclusive uh, just for the newsletter. But if you want to know um, what precious little gems are falling out of my brain every day, I'm most often on Twitter at ka underscore Mitchell. And I've just started on Instagram. Facebook terrifies me. I go on and I feel so awkward. So I throw up promo and run away. Um, it's it's just not my my thing. But I do try and participate in what they call One Line Wednesday on Twitter every Wednesday. And that's where you they give you the Kiss of Death RWA chapter offers up a theme and everybody posts a line from their work in progress. And that's a lot of fun for me to find something that matches the theme. So I try and post that all of the time. So if you're interested in what I'm working on, that's a, a great thing. You can just follow the hashtag and you can see a lot of other authors ideas, or you can just follow me and the hashtag and then you won't have to wade through a lot of tweets. <laughs> Well, fantastic. We will link up to all of these things that we've talked about in our show notes so that folks can find them. Thank and you. Thank you so much for coming to hang out with us for a little bit. Oh, thank you for having me. This was so much fun. As always, thank you to K.A. for showing up and giving us a sort of peek behind the curtain of her writing process and her uh, beloved series, Bad in Baltimore. Yes, I really enjoyed hearing about her process uh, and how, how much she does you know, embrace pantsing and how she builds her mm -hmm. characters and stuff. It was really fascinating. Yeah. Okay, guys, I think that's going to do it for this week's episode. Just a quick reminder, if you'd like to know more about how you can help support the show, all you have to go go do is uh, go to our Patreon page. That's at patreon.com slash biggayfictionpodcast. There you can learn about how you can support the show for as little as a dollar a month. And uh, plus you can learn about all the bonus stuff that we give you, like uh, special episodes, the opportunity to ask questions of some of our upcoming guests, which we've got some really good ones coming up in 2019. Mm -hmm. So you'll want to definitely check that out. That's it. Patreon.com slash Big Gay Fiction Podcast. P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Big Gay Fiction Podcast. That's right. Now, coming up in episode 171, we have Lisa, who is formerly of the novel approach. She's going to be joining us with some reading recommendations. Yeah, I can't wait to see what she's going to add to my TBR this time. Oh, Lord. <laughs> more books. Always more books. So everyone, remember, no matter where life takes you, the journey will always be sweeter when you have a book. Until next time, everyone, please keep turning those pages and keep reading. For detailed show notes and links to everything discussed in this episode, go to biggayfictionpodcast.com. New episodes are available every Monday at all major podcast distributors. You can also find us on YouTube. I'm Derek McLean. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. <laughs>